Hello everyone. My name is Sandy Ligret. I'm the director for the Deaf Studies program here at BCC and I've coordinated this event, this event for this evening. Before we proceed, I have a few announcements and thank yous that I'd like to share with everyone. I just want to clarify uh, communication this evening. There'll be no spoken English happening over the loudspeakers. Everything will be put on the screen in caption. The reason that I chose this method is because I thought that it would be an, a wonderful opportunity for everyone to experience an ASL space and an ASL environment. I want to honor ASL this evening. And I wanted to have it be a universal design so that everyone could have access to whichever language is their natural language, whether it be English or ASL. I wanted to provide this opportunity as an experience that would give you the experience for what it feels like and what it looks like to have access to a language other than your own. I'd like you to trust the professionals that are working here with us tonight who are signing their message and if you're not sure that you can trust that you can trust that the professionals are able to do that they have the experience to provide that message to you so it's a learning experience for you as well when the presentation is over please remain seated because there will be an opportunity for questions and answers with president wagner and the microphone is over here to your left in this area, so you will go to the microphone and you can ask your questions there. We will not be providing one to the right of the seating. It will all remain to the left side. So just walk over, try to get yourself through the aisles, and stand in line if there is one to ask the questions that you need to. Or you can walk up to the back where it's empty and you'll have plenty of room to walk through to come over to the line where the microphone will be. The question and answer period will happen at that time. Thank you for your time. There are a lot of people that have supported this event for this evening. Of course, the BCC family that I, that I appreciate and cherish so much, President Sprager, Sprager as well, the facilities. There are a variety of people who have been involved in providing the support services for this evening. We want to thank Office of Disabilities for the Deaf Services, and there are so many people that I could name in order to provide the services, the CDIs that we've chosen, the interpreters, and all of the work that was coordinated with all our professional, locally skilled interpreters. So I'm grateful and I honor the work that everyone, including ODS, has done this evening. Thank you to the community. Thank you to Mass State Association of the Deaf, Rhode Island Association of the Deaf, Rhode Island Commission for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing and Mass Commission for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing for collaborating with me in arranging this evening. As you see up here, I have a list of, of, of sponsors that I would like to thank for this evening that could make this evening possible. I'd like to thank the students of BCC who have come to volunteer for this evening who were interested in helping and it's their first step in becoming an ally and a partner, so I applaud them. And, and my last important thank you is to all of you for coming this evening. Thank you so much for being here. Regardless how well you plan an event, without attendees, it wouldn't be so successful. So thank you again for coming this evening, and thank you for sharing this with everyone and telling others to come and encouraging them to come this evening. I'd like to know where all the junior NAD individuals are. Where are these our young deaf individuals. You never know, you could be a future deaf leader. Who knows, maybe a future NAD president is seated in this audience right now. We'll have to wait and see. Are we ready? Please help me welcome President of National Association for the Deaf, Chris Wagner. Thank you. Oh, it's so nice to be here. Thank you. I'm really thrilled to be here in Massachusetts. It's an honor to be invited here to BCC. For a few years now, I've been spending a lot of time traveling around the country and visiting various regions of the country. And I've had the opportunity to meet so many wonderful people from all over. 
within the deaf community all over. Do you realize that before I got involved with the National Association for the Deaf, I thought the deaf community was pretty standard, but they're not. The deaf community in Massachusetts is so different than the one in California or the one in Seattle, Washington, or in Florida and Texas. It's so diverse. And the needs and the concerns of deaf people are diverse. And for the last four years, I've been so involved, and I've had the pleasure to be on the board for 10 years. Wow, what an experience, and president for the last four. And I feel it's important to share with you what I've learned out there in all my travels, and give some feedback and advice with you so that you can be aware and know what's happening within the deaf community. You know, the National Association for the Deaf has been around for 135 years. 135 years. Do you know why? Remember the Milan Conference in 1880? And that's when they wanted to ban sign language and force every deaf and hard of hearing child to speak. Spoken English was the only acceptable language. No signing was allowed. And we overcame that. And ASL is here. It's a beautiful language. But that 135 years ago, we fought against oppression. And we wanted to support our language. 135 years later, we are still fighting oppression. Our work is never done. I'm really excited to be here and share some things with you, share some thoughts with you. And my, my comments will be thought-provoking. And the real intention behind it is to have everyone in the audience be on the same page. To have everyone understand and take with them what, I'm, what is being said. The NAD cannot make changes alone. It requires everyone's participation to be part of this community. I see we're having a little technical difficulty. One moment, bear with me here. It should be working now. <coughs> I'm going to be talking about community ac accountability tonight. What do, you, what do I mean by community accountability? That's including the deaf, that's within the deaf community. Many of you are leaders in different ways. And how do we set up goals as leaders? What do I mean by a community accountability? There's so many different people that have various perspectives on what that means. About 10 years ago, we thought, all right, community accountability. But the more that I got into this issue in my journeys as president of NAD, I realized that a community accountability is still a huge issue, more than you even think. We must preserve our community. 135 years ago, people wanted to destroy the deaf community. And today, 135 years later, we still have people that want to destroy our community. 
Are we taking enough accountability? Are we really fighting it enough? Are we taking enough responsibility to stop what's happening? I don't think so. And my goal here is to share my experiences in my travels, things I've heard from various people. And I want to spread the word to you. My goal is for everyone to be more knowledgeable about their accountability. So here's a question. What's the major concern within the deaf community? Some people think American Sign Language, some people think deaf education, teaching, employment, health care. There are various issues. Everybody has a different major concern. But really, for me, that's a fact. For many years we've talked about hearing people oppressing deaf people. Hearing people are so oppressive. From various avenues we've talked about the oppression from the hearing. Yes, in fact there is oppression. I've experienced oppression. We all have. But we also have oppression within the deaf community. I'll give you an example. About three years ago, a friend of mine who works for the Deaf Literacy Center in, in Florida, it's a great program there. They provide services for deaf and hard of hearing families. And she can hear, but she's very skilled at signing. And she sent me a text and said, do you mind coming to my office and meeting this 23-year-old single mother? I was quite busy, but she said, I really need your help. She just found out her baby's deaf. I said, all right, fine. So I had a lunch break, drove over to the program, and I met this mother. She didn't know how to sign. She's hearing. It was her first experience with this deaf baby. She didn't know what to do. And of course, she went to doctors and and counselors and said, oh, you need to implant that child. That child must speak. And the mom heard that advice and she's thinking, but what are my other options? Don't I have others? And she found the program, the Deaf Literacy Program, and she, they discussed signing with her. Well, the other people are saying I should get a cochlear implant and have my child speak. She was a bit confused about the two options. So she went home and she did her homework. Oh, it's the wonderful internet age. You can get any resources you want in the blink of an eye. So she did a research on the internet. And she got even more confused. And it was just gut-wrenching for her. And she talked to the woman at the Deaf Literacy Program and had a discussion with her. And that's when my friend texted me and encouraged me to go meet with this mother. And we sat at lunch and... She was confused about, do I get a cochlear implant and have my child speak, or do I not, and have my child sign? And, and I explained to her the pros and cons about the various options. And my friend Rosa from the Deaf Literacy Program had said, talk about your experience. I said, all right. So I told her about my experience that I grew up oral, and there was no signing until I was 18 when I went to Rochester Institute of Technology. I explained my experience to her and how I felt growing up. And I said, you know, honestly, I was isolated. I, I didn't have a social development and I didn't have an understanding of human behavior. And I called myself a late bloomer. You know what I mean by that? Like a lot of things that kids learn growing up, I wasn't aware of because there was a lack of communication. So I was explaining all this to the mother, and I speak very well, and, and she noticed that, and I can lip read. And I said, you know, I use hearing aids, and, and the mom was listening to everything. I explained my whole life story to her. 
And when I learned to sign, I realized that I had missed so much, that I missed this real language. I didn't have a communication tool. I didn't have real language growing up. So I went into this whole story with her. And I said, and then she said, choosing a language is not the issue. I said, what do you mean? And she said, the deaf community is my concern. I said, what do you mean? What's your concern about the deaf community? And the mom said, the deaf community seems to be backstabbing and negative towards each other. And I could not believe that. I said, okay. I understand a lot of people are angry and frustrated. They've had struggles in their childhood and they're trying to vent about it. And mom said that she seems the deaf community is still frustrated. And she looked at the social media and looked at various things on social media. And the parents with babies who could speak and English and were implanted, the parents were so positive about their stories. So she saw all that happiness, and then she went to the deaf community. They're angry, and they're negative, and where would you want to put your baby? And I was taken aback at that moment. If that's one hearing mother seeing it that way, how many other hearing parents see it that way? So that led me to think about our own community accountability. What are we doing? We're fighting against people that oppress us and we're trying to fight that oppression, but we're not doing it within our own community. And that is the crab theory. And just taking people down. Do you know what I mean by crab theory? What are we doing about it? We need to address it. We need to fix it. That mom, then when I met other people, I heard the same things from them. And there were different views. As the NAD president, I've been to Washington, D.C. I've met various people, various stakeholders. We've had various discussions. I'm involved in two or three different organizations, like A.G. Bell. They've been involved in these discussions. And they have such a strong viewpoint and I'm and strategies. And since I've been in NID, it confuses me that they can be so supportive of the community when they don't support sign. They just want children to grow up speaking. But going back to my point, we as a community have to take accountability. It includes those hearing people that are involved in our community. Obviously, if you're involved, then the deaf community trusts you. They've let you in. And the point of my message is we need to stop thinking about, we need to start thinking about accountability. I'll give you some examples. With the power of social media, with vlogs and various things that can be posted, more and more people are taking the opportunity to get involved and in various ways to express their opinions. And they're trying to stop people from being successful. They criticize leadership. A lot of organizations, state agencies, deaf organizations, they say, oh, no, we're not. I say, why don't you have a deaf leader? And deaf leaders say, no, I don't want to get involved. Why wouldn't a deaf leader want to get involved? I'll give you an example. I was in Riverside, California, visiting the California School for the Deaf in Riverside at the time. And the superintendent was ready to retire. And I was sitting and chatting with him. And I said, 
why is it so hard to find people to apply for your position and replace you? There are so many awesome candidates, deaf leaders within your administrative team. I could point out like five to seven different people that were deaf, that were involved, and they would be ready for the director position. I said, why wouldn't they? Well, they don't want to. Why wouldn't they, was my question. They're tired of being attacked and oppressed by their own community members. They live in the same community. And can you imagine they're being oppressed by their own people? And I feel that needs to stop. How do we change that? What can we do to stop that kind of behavior? It's critical. It's a concern. Gossip. You know, hearing people gossip too, it's not just a deaf thing. Hearing people press each other as well. But our community is so fragile. It's so small. We need to cherish it. Our culture, our language, our history, we need to cherish it. It's imperative. We have to take more accountability than the hearing community. So gossip, being malicious and negative, that is so hurtful to our community. It hurts our efforts. Let me give you an example. When I first became president in 2012, I was so motivated and at the first meeting with A.G. Bell, it was a Council on Education for the Deaf, CED meeting, and it focused on accreditation for deaf education programs, accreditation for deaf teachers who want to become certified. It's a small organization. I think they have maybe 10 people were involved. A NAD was one of them. A.G. Bell was there as well. And A.G. Bell, it was quite interesting. The representative came up to me and said, oh, it's interesting what you're doing. And I thought, what are you talking about? Well, I know what you're planning to do. You're, pro you're trying to have a deaf child bill. And I said, I don't really understand what's going on. So I found out from the CEO that there are people watching NAD and deaf community activities. They're monitoring what's going on. It made me chuckle. I said, wow, you feel threatened. That's awesome that you feel threatened by us, that you have to monitor us all the time. But I also thought about what that mom said in Florida they're using that story of would you want, what one article said, would you want your child involved in the deaf community that's having so many issues? So here I go back to accountability. We need to r remind our colleagues in the deaf community, be careful, people are watching. Social rejection, lack of support, I've noticed in the deaf community, there are so many state agencies that are on the verge of shutting down, so many of them. They're not getting enough support. But we in the deaf community, what do we tend to do? We complain, 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 complain. Turn that complaining into action. You must do that. Stop complaining, do something about it. Oh, it's broken, it's not working, they're shutting down. Well, what are you going to do about it? You have to take the responsibility and turn that complaint into action. When I was growing up, my grandmother, it was so frustrating. Remember like that brown box that you used to use for the caption and it had the dials on it? You'd be so excited. I'm like, it's not working. And I realized not all shows were captioned at the time, right? And I would fiddle with this machine, and my grandmother would say, well, you're complaining. What are you going to do about it? Turn that complaining into action. Send a letter. Com and growing up, I remember, you always have to turn that complaint into action. Get involved. Do something about it. I feel strongly that we as a community, whether you're hearing, deaf, a coda, you're an ally, you have to take accountability. Why would you be involved in the community if you don't want to? So talking about the power of economics, ec economic empowerment, you know what I mean by that. Imagine, 
Let's talk about a local business. I was chatting with some people here earlier today, and they said, oh, yeah, Target. That's a great place. They hire deaf people. They provide interpreters. They're terrific. Home Depot is fantastic, too. They hire deaf people and provide interpreters. But Walmart, they're awful. All right. Walmart's not supportive. They don't hire the deaf. So, how many of you shop at Walmart? Hmm? Yeah. You are enabling the behavior by purchasing items. You're a consumer. I was in Alabama back in June. I had a presentation in Alabama, and I asked the audience, there were many VR counselors in the room, vocational rehab counselors, and I said, hey, name a huge business in Alabama that won't support access or hire deaf people. And they all said, Honda. Honda's a the Honda factory was down the road. It's this huge factory. They make cars. I said, hmm, interesting, Honda. And then I asked, how many of you own a Honda? And people reluctantly raised their hands. So you know what my point is? Support, don't support businesses that discriminate against you. Recently, a few days ago, deaf people stewed Starbucks. Because they discriminate against deaf workers. I'm talking about corporate social responsibility. They need to take responsibility. They're discriminating, they're discriminating against one of our own. We shouldn't support that business. They're not going to change their behavior until you change your behavior by stopping, by not being a consumer, by not purchasing their products. Same thing applies to interpreters. If an interpreter, if there's an interpreting agency that is not providing qualified interpreters, there, there's an agency that's using interpreters that are not qualified, they don't want to pay for certified interpreters, why would you use that agency? Doctor's appointment. You go to a doctor's office, you've been going there, and you say, would you go back to the doctor if, well, if you ask the doctor, if a deaf patient wanted to use your services, would you provide an interpreter? I bet you 80% would say no. 80% would say no. I'm not providing an interpreter. So if we could identify all the people who won't provide interpreters, who won't provide access to deaf people, So you, the stakeholders of our community, should you continue using those ser the services of those people or those places? Think about it. My point is that you need to think about the fact that I'm the, a member of the deaf community. I support the deaf community. Where's my dollar going? Who am I supporting? And I learned this way back. The GLBT community with Chick-fil-A, remember that controversy where there was a protest because the Chick-fil-A philosophy was contrary and homophobic? And it did affect their profits when people boycotted Chick-fil-A. It had an impact and I thought, why can't the deaf community do the same thing? If Walmart, well, in my personal opinion, Walmart doesn't take care of their employees. But in the big picture, discriminating against deaf people, why would we continue to support them? The same thing if you go to a movie theater. You know that movie theater won't provide captioning for movies. Why go? Why support them? That's what I'm talking about with accountability. For 135 years, we've been fighting and fighting and fighting. We continue to fight. And we have to do it together. We have to change their behavior so they get it. And I challenge each of you, go home, go to your communities, and see which services you're going to use based on, wait a minute, should I shop there? I wonder if they're supportive of the deaf community. Ask yourself that question. It doesn't hurt to ask the manager, excuse me, 
if a deaf person wanted to apply for a job, would they hire? Would you hire them? Nope. All right. Well, you lost a customer. I challenge you to do that kind of due diligence. That's the crab theory. It's more of really just bringing people down. Because you're climbing and you're successful and you, we just drag you down. That's what crab theory is. And part of our accountability is if we see other people doing that to other deaf people, we need to intervene. Don't turn a blind eye to it. You need to take responsibility and help stop it. Encourage deaf people to grow. And the reason I'm talking about all this is we're, honestly, we're in a crisis. People go, oh, whatever. It's happened for many years. Oh, so the deaf community is going to be gone. Really, we're in a crisis. Those of you, I've been talking, I talked to some great friends of mine today at lunch, and we were talking about the post-ADA generation. People who were involved, people who were involved in social media and video phones and texting, they never experienced what we did 20, 30, 40 years ago before technology was around. And deaf people were collectivists. They communicated, they socialized, they supported each other. They were all in one place. But today, that's dwindling. People communicate through social media. But we never really made that transition. What I mean by that is, you need to make a transition of how to go from one way to another, but also keep the deaf community intact while we do so. It's like, oh, surprise, we have a new technology, but we really never took action to see how that technology would change and have a better community. We really are in crisis. If you disagree with me, let me know. We really are in crisis. And we need to address it. And how we do is up to you. All 50 states used to have their strong state agencies. Just like here, we have the Massachusetts State Association for the Deaf. So now maybe there's about 43 active chapters. I get together with stakeholders in these states that I visit, and they go, oh, I'm not interested. Nobody wants to be a leader. Oh. When the deaf community starts crumbling, then everybody runs to us crying, help me, help me. We need intervention. We need some help. But again, who's responsible for that? It's not just the National Association for the Deaf. It's all of you. Everyone in the deaf community is responsible. Take action. It's sad that many of us just stand by and twiddle our thumbs and watch everything falling apart. I applaud those people out there that are rolling up their sleeves and they're not giving up. And they want to support and they cherish their organizations. I was talking to one person today at lunch and this person is passionate and so supportive of MSAD and they want to see the organization grow and flourish and it was amazing. And if we had more people like that all over, then we would be a better community. Really, we can't sit back. Well, think about this. What would it look like 20 years from now if we don't do anything? Think about it. We just sit back and let everything just fall apart. That's why I'm saying this is crisis mode. We must take action. Membership. Membership is declining in various organizations. There are various programs that are dwindling. For example, college programs, deaf studies programs, interpreting programs. 
we're trying to convince administration how important it is. I applaud BCC. It's so impressive, the program you have here. You don't find that in many places around the country. I visited many programs, and I'm really impressed with the programs that you have here at BCC. I think it's important that we work together in partnership and collaboration. Our community is still here. We want to make sure it's still here 135 years from now. Leadership. It's so funny. Growing up oral, I never thought that I was a leader. And then I went to college and I said, oh, wow, I can access communication. I have language. Fantastic. I'm a leader. But leadership is more about encouraging and fostering achievement to do more. Today I encourage people to say, you want to be a leader? You want to take over? You want to be president of the NAD? Oh, no. No, thanks. And I'm like, well... What's stopping you? Uh, you know, I'm tired of dealing with people and politics. Really, our, our numbers are more than just politics. NAD is not just about politics. We're about motivating, preserving, protecting our culture, our language, our human rights. That's what we're about. Still today, we're fighting for our human rights. Leaders go, oh, they think leadership is just about running meetings. No, it's more than that. It's about encouraging the community to unite and fight in what we believe in. Talking about support, there is a lack of it. And look at the people next to you. Do you support each other? Do you cherish the community? Do you preserve it? I get up in the morning, I say, what can I do? We all have to get up every morning and say, what can I do? Without you, there is no deaf community. And if there's no deaf community, there's no deaf studies program at BCC. So now going back to the vision, what's the goal? My vision, my board's vision, is to see a strong and viable deaf community throughout the country. We can't do it alone, though. We have to do it in partnership with you, with people like you, your friends, your family, your colleagues. Everyone needs to be included. I l attend legislative sessions and I meet with senators and representatives and I have dialogue with them and we talk about the needs of the deaf and hard of hearing community. About 20 years ago I was involved in Florida with legislation and trying to in educate people about issues and then I met one senator who happened to be a good friend of my father-in-law and I was saying nobody's listening to me and he said, well, you have to think like a politician. I thought, oh boy, rolled my eyes at that one. And that's one thing that's important. So I started going to the legislator in Florida, and we have 3.1 million deaf and hard of hearing people. 3.1 million deaf and hard of hearing, you know, senior citizens who are late and deaf, but that's okay, the numbers are powerful. Numbers are powerful. So I, as the NAD president, I can say I represent 48 million people. Those are people who control the funds. So what we do really does impact more than just 48 million. We impact family members and children and colleagues, and it, it's a domino effect from there. So in Florida, we had the 3.1 million, and I went to the legislator, and I started saying, we represent 3.1 million deaf and hard of hearing taxpayers and voters. Bingo! Their, their ears lit up. Oh, interesting. Do you see the change in their behavior and the power of language and my word choice? So, the goal is to 
sort of put this spider web together and have everything converge and envision our goal happening. Go to, I go to state agencies, I go to deaf communities, I make presentations. I said, what's your vision? What's your goal? I need to motivate people to set that up so the deaf community can then follow it and meet those expectations. You do the same. Ready to move forward? Okay. I just want to be certain that the interpreting that's happening over on my left is, is completed before I move on. The reason I, I put this slide up, I don't want to sound like a preacher, but I want to be sure that you truly understand how serious this is. It is serious. We must address it. We must face this challenge. We have a tendency to walk the walk, to talk the talk, but not walk the walk. And we have to turn that complaining into action. We have to turn that complaining into action. We must. We're running out of time. We are running out of time. We must stand up and take action. The deaf community needs you. Deaf America needs you. Now the things that I've said may cause you to reassess what you're thinking. What you want to embrace is what I'm saying. You have to. If you don't, you must want to because if you don't embrace it, then why would you come? I want you to see how critical this is, how important it is to have an impact. I can't tell you the first time that I walked on the campus of Rochester Institute, Institute of Technology, it to me felt like an electric shock flowed through my body. I felt like I was home. This is my home. This is my family. That experience that I had that day, many deaf people had not yet had that experience. Those who have been mainstreamed throughout the country may not have that same opportunity. The oral, the oral approach, they have it ready. It's like an army of individuals that go in and have their training. And they're all in their stance. We've got to gather everyone together to become one army. Not only deaf people, but all of you that are involved within the community. Students, Colleagues, workers, interpreters, we all must work together. We must stop the oppression. No longer allow the oppression to happen and as well encourage our own community to stop the oppression within our community. The reason I'm sharing this with you is because I want you to understand the impact and the importance of the impact on the deaf community. Imagine tomorrow, you woke up tomorrow and the deaf community was gone. What would your life be like? There is no deaf community any longer. There's no more Americans with Disabilities Act. There's no more ASL programs. There is no more recognizing ASL as a language. How would you feel? It's scary, isn't it? And you know what? It can happen. We have some crazy politicians in Washington. They're crazy. I've met some of them, and they say, what do you need that for? What do you need the ADA for? And it, and it shocks me when I look at them, and I think, you think that's a bad thing? And they say, of course, it hurts our business. If I could only <sighs> pop their eardrums for a moment and let them live that experience and live their life without being able to hear or without being able to see, just to have that moment, then maybe they would embrace it, but they don't. There are people, there are senators and representatives that don't agree with the ADA. It's very interesting. We have colleges and universities out there that don't agree with ASL being used in their classrooms. 
So the point that I'm making is that we do have to understand this is serious. We're not living in luxury where everything is great and everyone respects each other and everyone trusts each other. It's not that way. Let me tell you, it isn't. Certainly we have a lot of concerns. We have a lot of complaints about many things. We may may fly to Turkey. We may fly to Istanbul. When I did that back in July, I flew in July, they had the Federation for the Deaf, and it was impressive. I met numerous people, I think probably there were seven or eight countries that were involved. And through my travels, I met so many people, and there was international sign happening. And you'd have a conference with people looking up at the National Association for the Deaf thinking, oh my goodness, how impressive you're here from America. I realized that we have a lot of privilege here. We do have a lot of privilege here in America. Maybe you don't feel that way. Maybe you don't feel satisfied. But other countries don't have the rights that we have. They don't have the privilege we do, and they find us to be very impressive. There are the other half that are in attendance who hate America, despise us. They consider us spoiled, consider us that people that don't care. We complain about the little things. We're whiny. It was quite a rich experience for me. When you consider what you embrace, what you hold on to, and what you recognize within your community. Meeting so many different, diff various people, like Howard Rosenbaum and I had gone when we went together. We traveled together. And we went into a restaurant. It was more like a bar, but a restaurant. We went in and we sat down, and the two of us were having a conversation, having a drink. And as we were talking, someone came over to us and gestured for us to get out and leave. Deaf can't stay here. You have to leave. And I looked and I said, I'm, you know, that's my right to be here. And they said, no, nope, out. And I said, it's my right to be here. And we did get into a bit of a squabble. If you know me, I, I, I'll be fighting saying it's my right. I have the right to stay here. I've paid for my drink and I can stay here. And they continued to tell me to get out. And all the other deaf people that are here need to leave, but the hearing people can stay. I didn't understand what was going on and he just continued to say get out and I kept saying this is my right and then a police officer came with his AK-47 and stood there and said something which I didn't understand what he was saying and realized that deaf people don't have rights there we had to leave the bar very interesting so that really gave me pause made me think that we are fortunate in America but at the same time, it's very easy for us to roll back to their times, to regress back to that cultural thinking. It could happen. The point is that we need to take care of ourselves. We need to protect our community. So ask yourselves, what does accountability mean to you? Think about accountability. If you consider yourself, whether you're an interpreter, a deaf community member, a student, what is it that you can do yourselves with accountability? What is it that you're accountable for? It's a question to ask because this is serious. We are in a crisis. We need to take care of ourselves. We need to take care of our community. We must. I'm assuming that most, most of you are from Massachusetts, which means you can get involved with Mass State Association of the Deaf. You can work with them to make sure that your community is protected here in Massachusetts. Spread the awareness. Now I'd like you to ask yourselves, how can I be accountable? We must have open dialogue. We must have open dialogue. 
put everything right out there on the table and discuss it. What I have found in my 10 years and in my travels, diversity is something that we must address. Diversity means to be sure that everyone is included. To be certain that everyone has a voice. Speak out, have a voice, you must. It isn't to have your little groups, your cliques, your, your wealthy people in one circle, others in another. You all have to come together, work together, have a voice together. Have an open dialogue, we must do that. as well as your ethnic groups, to not have separation with your ethnic groups, you must all come together. Everyone must be part of the process. I challenge my board what the issues that they're working on. We must develop an anti-oppression statement within NAD to become an example for everyone. There are many organizations out there that have diversity statements, inclusion dis statements, social responsibility statements. Many agencies out there have these statements. And little by little, they're starting to have anti-oppression statements. And that's very impressive, very powerful. To have an anti-oppression statement is something that we need to consider, and I challenge my board to develop this statement so that it can be a standard and universal throughout our community. I think we must practice what we preach. Many times when I meet people, I hear a lot of complaints and grievances and their views and their concerns and what they've seen. And I ask them, speak out. Then speak out. That's my sign for speak out. Because we're using our hands, of course, to communicate. So this is my sign for speak out, but, it, but express it, speak out. The only way that you can make changes, the only way that you can make an impact on your community is to speak out. Let people know what your concerns are. Let people know what they need to change. This is one of my favorite quotes from Henry Ford. Of course, you all know who Henry Ford is. I don't buy his cars, by the way, but just so you know who he is. Coming together is a beginning. Keeping together is progress. And working together is success. I'm asking the same thing of the deaf community. We must work together. Regardless of you have difference of opinions, different issues, we must work together. Because if we don't, we can't be a successful community. The future of the deaf community is questionable. <coughs> As I've been saying, NAD has been here for 135 years, but we are not done yet. We want you to join us so that we can work together to fight oppression. We want you to join us to fight for better access, for better qualified interpreters in the school system, better employment for deaf people, better health care and access for deaf people. We all have to work together. Because if we don't, we won't get anywhere. Now that I've shared the accountability of the community, I want to talk a little bit about NAD.
I wasn't aware of NAD until I went to Rochester Institute of Technology and I was looking at one of the brochures. And as I was looking through, I was learning about NAD in the brochure. And at that time, I saw it but didn't think much of it. And then I got to Florida. I saw a lot of things that I didn't like in Florida. So I took my complaints and made them action. And then I got involved to the Florida Association of the Deaf, which is the same as the Mass State Association of the Deaf, and I got involved. And I started to be more aware of the NAD. And as time went on, I started to get it. And since then, it's been such a pleasure for me to be involved. If you think it's like a deaf club, it's not. It's a full-time job. But it's a volunteer position as president. But I wanted to give you an idea of what we do and how that ties into your state agencies and ties into what we do on a daily basis. You can take a moment to read this. The mission for the NAD is, as you see up here, to preserve, preserve, protect, and promote civil, human, and linguistical rights. So every time the board gets together and the headquarters makes decisions, it all ties into that mission statement. That is always key. Our vision is for language, culture, and heritage. We must embrace it. We must cherish it. We must preserve it. And we embrace diversity and inclusiveness. It's, it is sad to say, I think probably for a hundred year span, people of color were not allowed to be a part of the NAD. Women could not be involved in the NAD. And finally changes started happening in, I believe it was in 20, 2012. An apology was issued to people of color and women, etc., for preventing them from being part of NAD for all those years. And we wanted to impress upon people that we embrace and cherish the inclusiveness. The first woman president was elected in 1980 on the 100th year anniversary of NAD. I'm going to show you a slide next. It may be difficult for you to see it clearly, but I want you to take the opportunity to look at the seventh president, George Bettitz. The first person to really have a sign, signing displayed on video.
the message that George Bredditz, Bredditz was trying to <clears throat> to give everyone was the idea of embracing and valuing and cherishing our ASL. It's important. I know many of us think that ASL is here forever, and of course we want that to be the case, but we have to do that only by preventing people from destroying it. The NAD for many years has been involved in <clears throat> a variety of issues. We talk about issues of captioning. There is one proud landmark thing that has happened in history in the state of Massachusetts. In the year 2012, Netflix. We were very grateful to MSAD and, and other people that were involved in advocating to work with Netflix because the suit was, was put against Netflix because they <coughs> had their business but they were not captioning every video that was available and now that's 100% captioned and we just settled now with Amazon Amazon video for pe many people say Amazon what is that but they actually do have videos online and we just sat down with them and negotiated for over two years and we finally settled with them so that they will agree now to have a hundred percent captioning by the end of 2016 December of 2016 that's what I mean when I represent we 48 million people that are deaf and hard of hearing plus family members of those individuals and colleagues and friends and it just ripples out from there. The impact that we have is, is immense. We have to fight. We can't, we can't ask other people and other agencies and associations to do that for us. We have to be the ones to fight. We fought for captioning. We're still working on captioning for the news online and the internet. We're still pushing for that. Housing is another issue. You know that we've been working with HUD, Housing and Urban Development, in negotiations with them, expressing our concerns of not having access, having apartment buildings with all deaf residents in there. They wouldn't allow that. And we continue to negotiate and fight for that. The disabled community wants to be able to live within the community, was their theory. The disabled community fights to be able to live wherever they want. They don't want to only have to be limited to one building with everyone that is a tenant being disabled. And we understand that. We're not talking about disabilities. We're talking about language and culture. So we, we continued these discussions and negotiations with HUD. They were having a difficult time understanding it because they were not looking at the language and culture. They were looking at the pathological view of it. And instead, we started to use more of discussing the idea of using HUD for people, for example, who, use, who speak various languages. If you have individuals who speak Polish or Chinese or whatever the case may be, they would want to share their, cult their culture and language together and deaf people want to have that same access with ASL. So we continue to fight with housing for that. Employment is another issue that we still have the same unemployment rate. It's been that way for a long time now. And what's wrong here with having the same unemployment rate for year after year? We've got to change. People want to make career changes. There are cuts happening in, in VR. It's happening all over the country. So those are concerns that we have that we continue to fight for, for employment for individuals. The Department of Labor, we've been discussing with them and trying to find different strategies. Deaf schools as well. That's one important area that we are focusing on now. We have concerns going on with some of the schools in Pennsylvania, Arizona, and other various locations. And now we have about seven schools that have superintendent positions vacant. And as I address each one, they say that there are not enough deaf people to take these positions. <laughs> And it is a concern. Arizona announced they have five finalists for their superintendent position. Four out of five can't sign. Imagine. So we have to fight and, and negotiate and, and 
Write our concerns, express our concerns to them. How could you pick a leader that cannot understand the language or the culture? Prisons. It's interesting, in the state of Louisiana, <coughs> there's an interpreting agency. They have one interpreting agency that decided that they would provide interpreter training to hearing prisoners to become interpreters for the fellow inmates in the prison. I have a problem with that. I do have a problem with that. Where is the deaf person's right for privacy and confidentiality? They're not required to follow any code of ethics if they're working as an interpreter in the prison. There's no certification. Because they don't want to pay for the interpreters, they decide rather than pay for the interpreters, we'll have a solution. What we'll do is we'll train these particular inmates. I think there were 13 or maybe 16 hearing people within the prison that they thought they could train for two years. Give them a certification, a so-called certif certificate of completion so that they could interpret in the prisons for the deaf inmates. That's not right. So we've been fighting for that. Some prisons refuse to provide interpreters. They refuse to provide any kind of video relay opportunities, video phones, any equipment of that nature. When's the last time you touched a TTY? How long ago would that have been to use a TTY? So again, they had the issue with interpreters. We want to be sure that we have qualified interpreters within the school system. Many states don't have a minimum requirement for someone to enter the school system and act as an interpreter. That's a concern of ours. The qualified interpreters within the, commun within the community as well is a concern for us. ASL, education, we're concerned about our deaf schools and the mainstream programs. Are they providing accommodations and access for the students? And we all know LRE, we know what that stands for, right? Least restrictive environment. Least restrictive environment. I have an opposing view on that, what it should be. LRE are the initials, but language-rich environment. Language-rich environment. LRE. We must be sure. Least restrictive environment? How could that apply to deaf students? It does not apply at all. Language is key. Language rich environment. Child protection. We've had some children taken away from their deaf parents because they're deaf. Because there's no communication. Then they go back to the interpreter. And then they bring in a CDI. And some people don't understand some interpreters. So they have a CDI in this situation to clarify communication. So we've been dealing with the child protective investigation agencies and the like, and health care. Hospitals not in prior, providing interpreters, trying to provide VRI. And you know what the problem is with VRI, right? If you're, when you're in the hospital? Okay, you know there are, there are issues with VRI. And uh, there was, a, at one point, we established a task force regarding VRI. This task force got together. I think there were 15 people on that task force. And we had deaf senior citizens of America. And everyone got together to work on the various issues and using their individual expertise. And they said, what is the minimum standard for VRI? Right now, there are no standards. There are no standards established for that. So we want to set some type of standard. And from that experience, well, we're still in the middle of the suit, but, but the, at George Washington University in Washington, D.C., we had a suit against that hospital. Well, it's George Washington University Hospital, let me clarify. <coughs> it's 100% VRI, and that's all they offer. The reason for that is because a deaf person goes into the hospital and they, the person had to stay for one month and needed services for 24-7 for one month. 
So when they saw the bill for that one month's stay, the hospital reacted uh, reacted towards that bill and decided that VRI would be the way to go without uh, providing any choice for an individual. So they do what they can at the last minute just to do the minimal access that's necessary. That should not be the only option for an individual. So we want to send, set up some type of minimal standard, whether it be technology, qualifications, quality, clarity on the screen, depending, I mean, some individuals in the hospital and it's very awkward positions to try to hold that screen for an individual to be able to access what's being signed on the screen. So we want that done by January 26th and finally before April 26th is the deadline. You may be curious as to who's involved with the NAD. Well, I'll give you a picture of who's involved with our organization. We have 14 board members who are totally committed in a volunteer position to supporting NAD's mission. On Being on the board is not easy. We try to please everyone and that's not easy. But I have a group of people who are committed and supportive to the mission of NAD. That is critical. And I'm thrilled to introduce my team. I love my team. Well, that's me. And all of the board members are volunteers. Nobody gets paid for being there. And almost all of them have full-time jobs in addition to being on the board. Well, except one. Howard Rosenblum. He is the CEO, and he works for the board. He works in the NAD headquarters in Silver Springs, Maryland. It's close to Washington, D.C. So that's me. I'm the president. I'm from Florida. And we have Melissa Draganic Hawk. She's from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. She is also the principal of the Pennsylvania School for the Deaf. And we have Joshua Beckman. He's from New Jersey. He's a teacher of ASL. Felipe Montalet. He is from Salt Lake City, Utah. He's a treasurer. And he's the data, database administrator. And then we have Howard Rosenblum, who is an attorney. He's one of 400 deaf attorneys in the country. Howard is originally from Chicago, Illinois, and now he lives in Maryland. And he's been there since he became CEO four years ago. We have Pamela Lloyd Ogok, and she's from North Carolina. And she was appointed board member to focus on organizational partnership. A lot of organizations partner with NAD, and we wanted to choose a board member to focus on that. And Pamela also was the first woman president of the National Black Deaf Advocacy. Alicia Lane Outlaw, she's from Minnesota. And she was appointed by the board to focus on marketing and outreach. She owns a marketing company. She's a consultant in Minnesota. We have four regions throughout the country. There's region one, two, three, and four. Here in Massachusetts, you're involved in region one. And it's exciting that in July of 2018, we will be hosting our bi biannual conference in Hartford, Connecticut. That's not that far. And we will also be celebrating our 200 year anniversary of deaf education with American School for the Deaf. That's an exciting event. So region one. We have Michelle Klein from New Jersey. She's a mental health professional. And also Steve Lovey. He's from Rochester, New York. 
and Steve is a nonprofit manager and a consultant. In Region 2, in the middle there, we have Richard McCohen, and he's from Omaha, Nebraska. He just retired from the post office, and now he's teaching ASL at a university. And Jenny Buchner. Jenny is from Madison, Wisconsin, and she works in Relay. And with Region 3, we have Holly Ketchum, who is a statewide coordinator for VR in Little Rock, Arkansas. And Jerry Nelson, well, Jerry lives in St. Augustine, Florida. He works for a relay service. In Region 4, that's in the West, there's David Reynolds from Fremont, California. He's an actor. Some of you may know him as Dr. Wonder. Sherry Collins. She's an executive director of the Arizona Commission for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing in Phoenix, Arizona. They are great, skilled, committed, supportive people in the deaf community. Every two years, the NAD hosts a conference. We all get together every two years. And members convene, and we have delegates who vote on various issues representing state agencies. Massachusetts State Association for the Deaf has a representative as well and involved in the discussions. And we tend to have over 60 various motions. And then we decide which areas the NAD really needs to focus on and prioritize over the next two years. So we go over it for about six, two to three days, and we dwindle that 60 down to about five. We do the top five. And the deaf community, whatever their major concerns is the top five, we're not only limited to the top five, but that's what we prioritize. The first one that we decided on was preservation and advocacy for relay services. We really cherish our relay services. The government looks to cut and change and, and change the relay business. And it's not just VRS, but IP relay and various access. And that's a concern for us. And members want the NAD board to watch and protect this cherished service and tool that we use. A second priority is FEMA communication to the deaf and hard of hearing. You know, like for example, when you went through Hurricane Sandy, things were a mess. And now there was that famous interpreter in, in New York that was interpreting on TV with Mayor Bloomberg and you see, saw that on TV, and interpreters were becoming much more visible. But the community is not satisfied with the communication, so they've asked NAD to get involved. So as president, I've set up a task force to focus on the issue of emergency preparedness. And we chose Neil McEvitt, McDevitt from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He's deaf, and he used to work for FEMA, he is quite knowledgeable. I said, do you mind leading the task force? And he was willing to roll up his sleeves and get to work. And we've developed a guideline, a recommendations, it's a toolkit for local, state, and national emergency preparedness. You have to prepare communication before the disaster, during, and also for after the disaster. It's imperative. We're developing that toolkit. A third issue is preservation of mental health services that meet, meet the needs of deaf people. 
This involves various areas. One of them is related to the Affordable Care Act. It's known as Obamacare. <coughs> the official name is the Affordable Care Act, ACA. There's a lot of language and the provisions in there. It's pretty complicated, but we were concerned about the fact that many deaf people who are professionals and sign themselves, they're therapists, counselors, psychologists, some of them can sign and directly interact with, with patients. But within the system, it says you can't use them. So we want to make sure that that's waived so that we can include those professionals who sign and people can have direct, direct access through their language. Another part of it is a lot of states don't have direct mental health services for deaf and hard of hearing. There are four states, Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina, and Missouri. Oh, no, that's Minnesota. Those are five states. So they have direct statewide mental health services. We want to make sure that the other 45 states do the same. That's our goal. So we're developing a model legislation to plan of how to, to in, in, implement and also convince the legislators to add that kind of program in the remaining states. Defining and supporting the education strategy team's focus for 2014-2016. In 2012, when I became president, the first thing I did was set up an ed education strategy task force. I knew that it was a big issue. And since I've become president, then all of my board meetings have taken place at school for the deaf or at a mainstream school. The experience was very interesting at the Main Street School. We've always been to a, at a school for the deaf. We've done it all over America. And we wanted deaf children to see, oh, that's cool, the NAD is here. And at the same time, we had the opportunity to also visit the schools. And each school was different. We went to two mainstream schools that were in sh the city of Chicago. Wow. We saw barriers, and at the same time, we saw things we'd never thought of, especially parents whose first language was Spanish. The educational strategy and their goal, they had a few goals. They have a few goals. It's to make sure that every deaf child is ready to sign by kindergarten. To make sure that from a baby they're exposed to language, and that K through 12, that they have equal language access as everyone else. <clears throat> and at the same time, looking at qualified interpreters in the school system, looking at EIPA, and looking at various things involved in the re education strategy team. I'm really proud of the work they do. <clears throat> and the educational strategy team, there were a few things that came up and I thought, Hmm. You have ju do we have junior NAD here? We have some hands up there for junior NAD representatives. All right, terrific. I'm so glad you came. And I understand that you're so fortunate that you have been able to have the opportunity to experience junior NAD. A lot of young people don't have that opportunity. You're fortunate. I never had that opportunity. I didn't even know about the organization. But looking around the country, I noticed that many schools for the deaf, their junior NAD numbers are dwindling. It's a trend going on around the country. And a lot of the mainstream programs don't have that opportunity for their students. So I ch challenged my youth task force to explore and develop and implement it's going to be announced next month, but I'll talk about it here. A Metro Junior NAD. And what I mean by that is, I'll give you an example. So, let me use Boston as an example. There are some schools for the deaf around, and there's some mainstream programs. So why should they have separate chapters? We're going to put them together and have a Metro Junior NAD, where we can incorporate every deaf and hard of student, re re student in the region. Can you imagine how powerful and impactful that would become? 
Can you imagine what they could learn from each other? What they could share, the resources, the stories. And more than just sharing that, but language. With the Metro Junior R NAD, I'm encouraging that, and we're going to announce it next month. So that's one part of this outreach to deaf youth. We want to change. And a proposal is for a National Deaf Youth Day. We're in discussions about starting that. The National Youth Day would be annually in March. We're thinking March 6th. And that would be in tune with the DPN protest anniversary in March. And we want to, that Deaf President Now protest was amazing. So having that uh, close to that anniversary would be great. And we'd like to continue that annually. And we want to incorporate more mainstream schools. And 85% of kids are in mainstream schools. We want to include them with the NAD. That's our goal. All those five priorities I've been putting out to you, I'm not alone in doing all that work. We value the collaboration between various partners. We want to work together to make all those five priorities a success. We can do it. We collaborate with various organizations. We ha officially have over a hundred collaborators. They're partners within NAD. We work together on various initiatives, on various issues. So, for example, talking about housing and VRI, we have Deaf Senior Citizens of America involved. We have interpreting agencies involved, CDIs. So all these various agencies listed are involved, plus others. So this is an example of who we work with every day. Like I was mentioning, the Junior NAD Conference is coming up next month. That's in Orlando, Florida. We're excited, and we believe over 150 students are attending. And they're going to be the next leaders, maybe even the next NAD president. Let's hope one of them will. And in July of 2016, we will have our 53rd biennial NAD conference. We have it every two years. So we're excited. That's going to be in Phoenix. It will be hot, but everything will take place inside. There's air conditioning. So join us for that. So now we're going to open up the evening for any questions. I'm willing to answer any questions you have. Um, Sandy mentioned that anyone who wants to ask a question needs to come up here to where the red X is. And we have um, people here to interpret. I have a CDI here. Just hold on one moment. We need to change the screen. So, I'm open to any questions you have. Don't be afraid. Don't feel like it's a stupid question. Just bring those questions out. I'll do my best to answer them for you. And line up over here if you have any questions, all right? We'll go ahead and start. Who's the first person asking a question? allies for the deaf community. That's a good question. The best way is to stay involved. Stay involved with the deaf community. Earn their trust. And then you'll need, need to know, you'll know what to do as an ally. Be involved, work with the deaf, and remember, let the deaf community lead you.
You're there to support them, and that's the best way to do it. Wow, I was really surprised at some of the things that you mentioned. You said 400 deaf attorneys? Is that true? So why are there no, you know, uh, bills and laws passed that are beneficial to deaf people? I mean, as they understand the culture and all that, I'm wondering why they aren't more involved. And sometimes, you know, the commissions of these states, they don't have a list of deaf lawyers. A lot of the deaf lawyers work in corporations where they're not in disability rights. They're not in Americans with Disability Act law. There are only a few lawyers that have a focus on that. They go where the money is. I mean, it's sad. Don't look at me. I'm not an attorney. But... A lot of the attorneys in Florida, for example, there, there are many deaf lawyers that work for the government, too. That's a big one. And some work for corporations like Procter & Gamble and, and big companies. And then there are a few ADA lawyers. It's just a few. It's a handful. Sad. Howard Rosenblum, he's a perfect example. He, goes, he gives back to the community. We have six attorneys in our office at the NAD office. Four are deaf and two can hear. And they work tirelessly. And we use them to sue, but we don't do divorce law or housing issues or things like that. We sue f to change the system. And then people say, oh, the NAD office, I need a lawyer. I need to have, I have a civil suit. This guy owes me $600. We don't represent that. We focus our resources and energies on changing the system. So there are 400 lawyers, but cor let me stand corrected. Out of the 400, I have to ask Howard, how many of those 400 can sign? I'd probably say half. So we still have 200. Right, we still have 200. She needs to use the microphone so she can hear. Trish. 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 Use the microphone so she can hear. Hi, my name is Tim Riker. I teach at Brown University. Uh, and I think we met in 2012 uh, when you were elected president. Thank you so much for coming here. And your presentation was very interesting on several different issues. Wish we had more time to talk about them in depth. But some of the things that struck me, the deaf community numbers that being very small, our economic power, our ability to change things, I think we would need more allies to help us do this. Not just allies who are hearing, but I think we need to become allies within different groups. Because we're so small in numbers, I think we need to support each other more, and that will empower us more. You had said towards the end that there were many different organizations, um, but they're all still deaf organizations, like RAD, you know, the Rainbow Alliance for the Deaf, uh, NACP. There are many different organizations that are also working for people of color, uh, people in the gay community. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I guess I'm just curious, mm -hmm. what kind of strategy do you think that could be used to hit a broader or audience? Good point. We've been in partnership with APD and the National Federation for the Blind and Americans Association of the Blind. There are various disability groups that we've been in partnership with, but we're really looking at language. So, for example, I'm I'm sick of them, but we have to keep your and you know you have to keep your enemies close, right? There are various things we work with the National Trans 
tourism board and various places where we have people from NAD on various boards. We have meetings with them all the time and on a on an a frequent basis and we sit down and we talk to them about the various issues during these meetings so you're right we do need to be inclusive of outside stakeholders as well because then that will have a ripple effect absolutely follow-up question to your comment I think a lot of the problems that we see seem to relate with disability and people want you know more mainstream programs and things like that but that's really contrary to what our beliefs are and uh, what we believe is important you talked about you know uh, education and 85 percent of it being in mainstream programs i mean i was one of them and i thought that more was being done but our resources are so little. I think maybe the disability groups should maybe change their approach in terms of working against the mainstream situation. So, and work toward both of our goals. Well, I'm glad you brought that up. I'll give you an example. We work on on the Alice Cogswell Act. And it's an amendment to the IDEA. And we're trying to put a lot of our things in there, but we have to get in by, we have to get buy-in from other disability groups. Groups, Like I was saying with HUD, other disability groups don't want separate housing and they're objecting to it, but we explain our stance and they, understand where we're coming from and there is a lot of energy and effort put in and money to get them to buy in but we need to work with the disability community we have to listen to them as well as them listening to us so a perfect example that really took me aback is a school for the deaf people are like oh they're getting smaller they're closing down we see that happening a lot but the trend is that a school for the deaf with the blind they leave them alone I'm like, oh, that's interesting. No one wants to mess with blind people. They leave them alone. So we work with a lot of different stakeholders and they're involved. Thank you so much for your responses. Let me keep going, I'm on a roll. Hello, I'm Andrew. I'm from Boston University. Wonderful presentation, really enjoyed it. I have a question with regard to what are you doing in general with regard to the deaf community and oppression? For example, the hunger strike that's going on. And, you know, that's a life and death situation. You know, I think we should resolve the, the issues. I mean, I noticed within your presentation, it talked about the crab theory. And uh, I'm wondering how we might be able to get involved in that, how we can facilitate, I know this is a difficult question, but maybe the NAD, you know, will, how, how will they will start the fire under some of these people to be involved? I, I, I know that, I knew that would come up. Um, we've had a discussion with WPSD administration and various stakeholders involved. We're watching it closely. The, the school for the deaf that we're, that we're, that's in Pennsylvania, I can't, I can't. The Western, Pen sorry, there's an interpreter error here. The Western Pennsylvania School for the Deaf in Pittsburgh is what he's talking about. And they're having a hunger strike and they're feeling oppressed within the school system. And the administration and the teachers are oppressing the students. And this gentleman asked what the NAD is doing. We are involved, we're watching it closely. We've been in touch with the superintendent and the people there and the discussion going on about how they're addressing it. But they have various facts 
and we've talked to the educational strategy team and we are monitoring the situation very closely with them. We're negotiating to see what we can do to respond to the community. You have to remember that a lot of people think that the NAD should just go and take over. We can't do that. We don't control that school. But we are monitoring. We are concerned about it. And we have to be a sort of, you know, put our ducks in a row before we make any announcements. We don't know exactly what's going to happen. We have deaf people who said, WPSD is fine, I work there, there are no issues, and then we have another contingency saying, oh no, we're oppressed. So we have to represent all deaf people. Which side do we take? We're damned if we do, we're damned if we don't. So we really need to assess that situation more carefully. Thank you very much for uh, answering my question, especially about the hunger strike. My other question is, You're talking about grassroots? The grassroots deaf community. That's a new sign for grassroots. That's a new sign. Grassroots, so you've learned a new sign tonight. So I'm just thinking, wow. This is a golden opportunity, you know, to, to take some of that anger and use it, you know, constructively. Maybe some of the other organizations should get the opportunity, you know, to get some change happen, and I guess that's where do we stand right now with We're that? there. NAD is there. We're supporting them, and we're helping them connect with the right people in government. And we've been connecting with government. We've been getting them involved and encouraging the grassroots movement, too. And so they are motivated and things are happening. We're giving them support. So we took their concerns. We brought them to the Department of Labor. in Lakewood, and there we fostered a dialogue between them. Thank you. Hi, my name's Julie, and I'm from Deaf Services here at Bristol Community College. I wanted to thank you for talking about Amazon and issues related to captioning, but I wonder if you could bring that to higher education. It seems that every institution is trying to reinvent the wheel in terms of figuring out how to caption media on our websites, in our online classes, and within our classrooms. And instead of everyone reinventing the wheel, I really think we're all looking to some national guidance around how to fund these endeavors and really do it efficiently with some quality assurance. Can the NAD speak to that? We've been involved with captioning in higher education Creighton University in Omaha, Nebraska wouldn't provide access to students. And at the same time, we were concerned about captioning on websites, online courses, and we decided to sue. And we're still in the process of the lawsuit. Um, we sued Harvard, MIT, a lot of universities in the Northeast. And we're trying to send a strong message. And at the same time, we're consulting with groups of experts on the technology side to give us an idea of a model, um, a guideline of, of, of how to do that so we can provide it to all the higher education groups and they can follow those guidelines as a model of how to provide captioning. Just to, clar to follow up, is the NAD working at all collaboratively with universal design specialists? Because the more we find that teachers can design their classes universally, the less we even need to provide accommodations. Is that an opportunity for collaboration that you've looked at nationally? I can't answer that. I doubt it, but we work with Disability Services at the University Center in Andrew, Andy Imperto, he is a director for University Center for Disability Service, something or other. He represents all the disability offices at the various universities in the country, and he's a great ally of ours. He used to be... Um, a legislative director under Senator Harkin, 
and he really understands the issue. So we've been close, working closely with him on various higher education issues. But universal design, I can't answer that question. Thank Sorry. You. Hello, I am deaf and have visual issues. You know, I'd like to be able to support myself, find a job. You know, I mean, I, I know that the situation isn't be best in the schools. You know, there's oppression there, barriers. I mean, there are some things that, you know, we do have. It's better, but it's really, really oppressive. And sometimes I feel like, you know, I'd rather make my own decision and just be gone. Thank you. I appreciate your comments. We have a group, group of deaf blind, blind people who have approached us to be part of NAD because there used to be an American Association for the Deaf and Blind, but that is not in existence because lack of leadership. And so the NAD has agreed to work closely with de the deaf-blind community and various organizations like in Seattle, Washington. And I think Baton Rouge, Louisiana, there's another one there. Those are the two I can think of. To talk about how we can support the deaf-blind community and provide resources from NAD headquarters for them. And I can't discuss some of the legalities, but there are some issues that we're addressing related to deaf, blind, and education access. Excellent. Awesome. Thank you. Hello. I'm Barbara. I'm from Rhode Island School for the Deaf. I'm part of Junior NAD in my school. Can you tell me how can you, you know, uh, improve the situation in terms of the deaf community and the numbers within? We can improve Junior NAD by looking at that Metro Junior NAD concept where it's not just limited to your school or a deaf program within a mainstream school. It's about the region getting together and working together in an organization. I think that's the best way to approach a strong junior NAD. Then you have more opportunity not just to associate with people from your school, but from outside the classroom, outside of other schools and schools in your area. Thank you. And we would like Can to we get a picture have with a our picture group, if you wouldn't mind. Soon. So We'll get all our people up here. And he said, I don't mind. I'll take a picture with you. They have no seniors this year. They have no kids graduating this year. Wow. Junior class of five kids. Oh, that's for the shelf floor, right? Oh, is that it? Yep. That's Steve's wife. Oh, no, no, no. She's a cool technologist. Go ahead. No, I don't want to. Are you having a hard time hearing someone, Shelly? Is it just the background oh, noise? Those are our future leaders. There they go.
Hi, Next my question. name is Ashley. I'm a student here at BCC in the Deaf Studies Human Services Program. The question I have is, most of, I'm glad to see that most of the high schools and colleges are letting you take ASL as a second language, but most of the universities are still challenging us to transfer it and accept it as a second language. What would your, be your best advice how we can challenge this appropriately? That's a good question. I think it's important and the best way to approach this is to work with MSAD, the Mass State Association for the Deaf, because they can go to other states and find the model of legislation that's been used. Like for example, in Florida, they recognize ASL. And why not use the model from Florida that they used on their legislative level and bring that information here and work with MSAD and work together with various agencies to model legislation and push the change. I think it requires a community effort and everybody working together. Not just you, but the deaf community, the interpreter community, everybody that would benefit from it. I think Thank that's you. great. Good evening. I want to thank you for coming here to take the time. You know, I hope you had a nice flight anyways. <laughs> but my name is Alan. Gifford is the last name. This is my sign name. With regard to Well, let me start with, I'm a deaf business owner. I have a company, actually two. One is for engineering and one is for construction. We construct and design for power plants and we also work with real estate. Okay, so my question is, uh, with regard to something that you m had mentioned about a, the state, I believe it was Arizona, that had a problem with Mal Walmart. Does the NAD have a list of deaf-friendly businesses and ones who are not deaf-friendly or ones who don't take care of their employees? I think that would be great for NAD to focus on that, maybe by state. I had a really bad experience with Walmart there in Arizona, but in Massachusetts, we have seven or eight deaf employees in Walmart, and they've been there for over 15 years, and full time. They haven't been laid off. You know, they've laid off other people and not the deaf individuals. So we do want to be careful about, you know, our purchasing power. And I think if you had one of those lists, Deaf people all over the United States would be able to join forces and be able to work together. Is that something that you're thinking about or is that on the website? We don't intend to because their behavior has to change. It's a real, it's a waste of resources, but with that economic empowerment, then that's on a local level. And you're right. Some Walmarts are doing a great job. Some aren't. Some Targets are doing a great job. Some aren't. So it really depends on the region that you're in. But I'm talking about local economic empowerment to change behavior. You're right. We don't keep a database. We get complaints. We, appro we approach the complaints. And if they don't do anything, we inform the community of that. And they can decide whether or not they want to support the community. Okay, well, in my role as president of MSAD, we have uh, partnerships with different organizations, also including the Massachusetts State Association for the Deaf. And we're really pushing 
for our interpreters to be certified, especially those in the mainstream public schools. We would like them to also be certified, as well as teachers who teach deaf students to use ASL. So the bill that we're trying to move ahead will address those issues and will force uh, will for, will force ASL proficiency for those in uh, those professional roles. So I've met a lot of people, and a lot of deaf people have issues with balance. And I've noticed a lot of them, um, you know, maybe are young and play sports. They don't have a problem. Like, I used to not have a problem. For me, it was about 40 years ago with vesticular disorder. And once I was hit with that, I was very sick. And I had, you know, the spins. So I went to the doctor and they're like, well, we don't know. So I'm wondering if there should be some sort of countrywide research for deaf people who were born deaf and what kind of situation and issues they have with balance later on in life. Because I, I often meet people who say, you know, I have the same exact thing. This is how I feel. I would say maybe 50% of deaf people have some sort of balance issue to some degree. It starts hitting about 40 or so. So do you have anything from NAD with regard we to that? We work closely with the national, oh, I forget the name. It's a national deaf health something. I don't know the exact name, but it's an organization, and I can get you in touch with them and let them know what we heard today. And we'll, I think I'll be back in Rochester in about two weeks, and I'll let them know your comments. Maybe you could give me your name and, and your contact information, and we could have them research that situation. Yes, there are, you know, several different names, communication disorders, vestibular disorder. So, yeah, it's a scary thing. So I think it's something that needs to be addressed for the deaf community at large. And uh, I'm Thank also you. an Thank RIT alumni, so I'll see you there. Uh, I do just have a question about. Um, one moment, please. I have a question about, um, you know, he hearing families who have, you know, deaf children. I understand that not all parts of the country might have like a, a program that we do in Massachusetts, where we do have sometimes people who are you know, deaf and hearing families, they have someone who comes in and teaches about the culture and about basic language. I was wondering if that's all over the country or if that's just like a state-to-state -state basis that they have that kind of program. Really, it is state by state. Some states... It is state by state. Some states out there do have a program like you're describing where they send deaf people to teach language and culture to families. Yes, some do, but it is not nationwide. Um, and then another question I have is, because um, I, I do have friends who you know, are from other countries, so they had to learn the language. So what they did was they watched children's shows. They watched things like Sesame Street to learn um, you know, numbers and grammar and spelling and you know, general things like that. Is there anything like that for people who are from another country who are deaf and need to learn American Sign Language? Is there anything like that? I can't answer that question. I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. 
Well, I just want to thank everyone for the opportunity to be here. I really appreciate being here with you and talking to you. And I hope that you got the message that I was trying to convey about what you can do with your accountability in the deaf community. So thank you so much. It was a pleasure.